God's faithful love. As true believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, we should live our lives from day to day with the full assurance of our salvation. Here's Gene. This principle is based on God's faithful love. And we see God's faithful love from Genesis to Revelation. And we need to understand that. And Jeremiah reminds us in uh, chapter 31, and again he is speaking to the people of Israel primarily, and he says this, At that time, and this is the Lord's declaration, I will be the God of all the families of Israel. And there he uses the name Israel to refer to Jacob. Israel's name was Jacob before his name was changed to Israel. I will be the God of all the families of Israel, or Jacob, and they will be my people. This is what the Lord says. They found favor in the wilderness. In other words, God didn't forsake them in the wilderness. God was faithful, even when they were unfaithful. The people who survived the sword, I protected them from their enemies. When Israel, that is, when Jacob, went to find rest, the Lord appeared to him from far away. Now this is referring to the time when Jacob was a very wicked, evil brother who had stolen his brother's birthright, and Esau was out to kill him, and he was running for his life. And it was there at Bethel that God spoke to him when he went to sleep, and he saw that ladder from earth to heaven, and the angels ascending and descending. And as a result of that revelation of God's faithful love, God reiterated the Abrahamic covenant, that God chose Abraham out of a pagan land, Ur of the Chaldees, as a pagan, made him a promise. I'm going to take you to a land, you'll become a great people, and through you the whole world will be blessed, namely through Jesus Christ. That was the promise. But when Jacob was at his worst, by the way, Jacob's name means deceiver. It means deceiver. And that's an interesting little story because when he was born, he came out of the womb second, and he had a hold of, of Esau's heel. And it became kind of a little joke because basically uh, a baby being born doesn't have prehension, which means ability to grasp. He hadn't learned that yet. And yet it looked like he was holding his heel. And the word Jacob was a word for deceiver, which was used of a wrestling move. And so it started out as a joke. Let's call him Jacob because of what they saw. Well, he lived up to the name, and he really became a deceiver. And really, a very wicked guy. But God still had His promise to Abraham. And so, He really reiterated that to Jacob. And I think that, by the way, was Jacob's moment of conversion there at Bethel. He had a long way to go in his spiritual development, but God was at work in his life. And so, he says here, picking up the thought, when Israel or Jacob went to find rest, the Lord appeared to him from far away. I have loved you with an everlasting love, therefore I have continued to extend faithful love to you. And that's really a foreshadowing of God's promises to us, His faithful love. Once we come to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, Notice the questions that Paul raised at the end of chapter 8 in the book of Romans. Who can separate us from the love of Christ? Can affliction or anguish or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, because of you we're being put to death all day long, we're counted as sheep to be slaughtered. In other words, what he is saying is, in the midst of all this persecution, which the New Testament Christians were facing at that moment in history, he says, can we be vic victorious? Can we be separated from the love of Christ? He said, no, never. And so he goes on, no, in all these things, 
we are more than victorious through Him who loved us. For I am persuaded that not even death or life, angels or rulers, things present or things to come, hostile powers, height or depth or any other created thing will have the power to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. This principle, you see, in the Old Testament here in the New Testament as the basis focuses on God's faithful love. Our salvation is based on God's faithful love. And so, when we think about that, think about this question. Why do some Christians have difficulty regarding their assurance of salvation? Well, I can answer that question from personal experience. I didn't have the assurance of my salvation, even though I was saved, because I wasn't taught correct doctrine. In fact, I was literally taught that if I did enough good works, God would forgive me. Actually, the word repentance was redefined to really be penance. And so I was taught that, you know, I maybe could be saved if I did enough to right what I had done wrong. And then I would have peace with God, and God would accept me. Now, I believe that in spite of that false confusion in my thinking, I became a believer. I did accept Jesus as my Savior, but all of that created confusion in my mind. Until one day at Moody Bible Institute as a student, I was reading the Book of Romans. And I came to chapter 4. And at that moment in my life, I was struggling with how I was saved. What was the place of works in my salvation? And there in chapter 4, I saw a reference to Abraham, and Paul said, how was Abraham saved? How was he declared righteous? He says, was he declared righteous when he was circumcised? Paul said, no. That happened when he believed God and God counted it to him for righteousness. Was he justified when the law was given, which was, by the way, 400 years later? And Paul said, no. He was justified when he believed God. And then he goes into chapter 5 and says, therefore, just like Abraham, that's the implication, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And it hit me. I'm not saved by my works. I'm not saved by my baptism. I'm not saved by being a faithful churchgoer. I'm not saved by my good works. I'm not saved because I made everything right I possibly could make right in order to please God. I was saved when I trusted God, when I believed Him, when I accepted Him as my Redeemer, as my Savior. Just like Abraham who looked forward to the cross, didn't understand it, we look back to the cross with full understanding that we have salvation by grace through faith, not of ourselves, it's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And that dawned on me. And for the first time in my Christian experience, after two or three years of professing Christ, I had the assurance that I was really saved. I wasn't kept saved by my good works. I was kept saved because of the grace of God in Jesus Christ. And it changed my life in a dramatic way in order to walk with Him in freedom, disciplined, as it were, by the grace of God, to live for Him because of what He had done for me. So here's the principle. As true believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, we should live our lives from day to day with a full assurance of our salvation.